I'm super mega extra excited to welcome on stage the next speaker, our keynote speaker, who's coming uh, uh, a long way uh, here in Bucharest. So we are going to talk uh, the hard things about hard things to say like this. Basically, privacy, uh, privacy on the internet, personal data, and so on and so forth. So please welcome on stage Christopher Wiley and uh, Vlad Andriescu, who's going to moderate the fireside chat. So Christopher, please. Guys, gentlemen. Here's one mic. I'm going to grab another one. Thank you. So, hello everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Vlad Andriescu, the editor in chief of Startup.ro. Uh, after the rock star of Romanian startups, uh, we're going to talk with a person who rocked our world uh, this year by exposing. Um, uh, the, the Cambridge Analytica scandal and uh, Facebook. Christopher Wiley is a consultant uh, for the government of uh, Great Britain and Canada, a data scientist, a researcher, and the former director of research for Cambridge Analytica. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for having me. Can people hear me? I, I always do a check just to make sure that, okay, yeah, cool. Hi, I'm Chris. Hi. So. I'm sure that many of the people from uh, from How to Web know about uh, about your work about uh, Cambridge Analytica. But being a startup event, I'm just gonna start uh, with asking you to make a one-minute pitch of what did you do in in Cambridge Analytica and what did the work involve. So um, I, I think a bit of background is is helpful for people to understand. I started out a company called SCL Group, was, which was a British military contractor. Um, the uh, research director uh, before me was actually Romanian, uh, but he died in Kenya. Um, and uh, I got brought on because uh, at the time, a lot of the clients of this uh, military contractor were looking for more expertise uh, in cyber, uh, cyber operations and information operations online. So the firm uh, went out, I got hired uh, to essentially take a lot of the research that they were doing in information operations um, and port that into cyberspace. So that included things like counter-extremism projects where we would take large volumes of data to profile people to identify who's most likely to be, for example, a recruiter for ISIS. How does that information flow through a network and how can we stop it? Um, Cambridge Analytica came out of that because one of our um, clients from the U.S. Air Force uh, was on a plane randomly uh, with one of uh, Steve Bannon's assistants. And they got chatting about what they do. And at the end, um, our client um, g essentially gave the contact details for my boss at the time. So Steve Bannon got in touch uh, with my boss. And uh, after a, a series of conversations, uh, Steve Bannon introduced uh, the company to a billionaire in New York by the name of Robert Mercer. And after those discussions, uh, Mercer decided to acquire the company uh, so that they could repurpose the research that we were doing originally uh, for military applications for political applications. So Cambridge Analytica sort of came from that. It, was, it, it, it sort of, in a weird way, was like a startup that came out of an existing company. Um, and so wh when that happened, um, that's when a lot of problems started occurring because we were taking research that was intended for terrorists and starting to apply them to voters. So we are at the end of 2018. Um, after uh, you exposed uh, what Cambridge Analytica did with Facebook data, uh, Facebook engaged in a PR campaign. It also changed some technical things, but I'm sure that Cambridge Analytica had competition on the market. So do you think nowadays, with what you know and what we know about Facebook, is the thing that you did still possible on the market? So the, the first thing that I'd say is that Facebook was actually aware of what Cambridge Analytica was doing, because Cambridge Analytica um, actually applied through the um, sort of app, app, the app application procedure on Facebook. Um, Facebook read uh, the uh, terms and conditions and, and authorized them. Interestingly, <coughs> nobody, one of no, nobody reads the terms well, and conditions. Well, I was just going to say, interestingly, um, when the CTO of Facebook uh, was at the parliamentary inquiry testifying in, in, the U in the British Parliament, 
uh, one of the things that came out is that Facebook actually didn't read the terms and conditions of the application that they approved. So they expect users to read terms and conditions when they don't even read terms and conditions themselves. Um, th the thing that I'd say is that um, in terms of sort of market competition, it's sort of, an, sort of an odd way to think about it because actually the original purpose of the research that we were doing was to help Western militaries compete with ISIS. ISIS is a digital first cultural brand, right? If you think about it, it recruits online, it organizes online, it disseminates its narratives online, and the problem with Western militaries, particularly in the United States, is that because they have so much money, they invest in these, you know, what, what are called kinetic weapons, which are traditional weapons, you know, things that blow up, right? Big missiles, big tanks, they're like boys with toys. They have lots of money and they want stuff that blows up. And when you think about it, if you are a, a programmer or a data scientist, your goal in your career trajectory is to go work at, you know, Google or Facebook, et cetera, which meant that the American military and the British military um, vastly underinvested in um, information and cyber operations. Um, and so the purpose of a lot of the research that we were doing originally was in terms of, if we're talking about market, to actually compete with the competitors to you know, Western civilization, which are you know, extremist groups and terrorist groups. Um, because they, because you know, they, they had to be sort of a bit scrappy. They didn't have lots of tanks, they didn't have lots of things. They realized that they can conduct a lot of their operations online. Um, and so, you know, th and that's important to understand because a lot of the things that Cambridge Analytica ended up doing are so egregious because they were being used against our own population, regular people. But what's important to understand is that what originally was intended was for this to be used against people who are trying to harm us, right? So if, you, if you're looking at a, an extremist group in North Africa, right, you can, your options are you can go and shoot them, or you can confuse them, manipulate them, trick them, and then eventually arrest them. And so that's what the purpose of the research. It, but when we think about what, what, what that means in, in terms of a democracy, if you're going out seeking to manipulate, trick, and coerce a voter, you're robbing them of their agency and their choice, and that's where it became really problematic. But it, did your work uh, has been applied also for good reasons, like you say, like uh, uh, cyber warfare against ISIS and terrorist organizations, or the purpose of the company changed and you never well, applied it, it? When when Steve Bannon and Robert Mercer took over, um, they just got rid of any sort of application that was, in my view, justifiable and, and focused solely on creating, um, you know, an ISIS-style insurgency in the United States, which is called the alt-right. Um, and, and what it was, it was taking techniques that the military would use to go and undermine, for example, a large narcotics operation in South America where you target people who are most prone to conspiratorial thinking, paranoia, neuroticism, and exacerbate those traits and then convince them of a conspiracy and then get them to recruit other people and slowly build out an insurgency from there to undermine you know, a criminal organization or a terrorist organization. Um, they were taking those kinds of tactics and applying them to just regular people in like Virginia um, where you know, they would see, and the whole role of data and profiling was essentially to replicate having you know, a, what you'd call a confederate or a mole inside of an organization who could spot out who's, who's probably should be a target of this, this operation. You can't do that in a you know, population of 300 million, but Facebook sort of allows you to do it. You know, they, they have all the data that does it for you. So the whole idea of the profiling was to identify people who had those particular traits. You show them adverts, you bring them onto groups or pages, and from that you start to develop a relationship with those people where you, sh you start showing them things that aren't necessarily true and it looks like news or it looks like just a regular guy but they're actually talking to a bot. They're ta the person that they're talking to is not actually real but they think it's real and once those groups get up to a certain threshold in numbers that's when they would start inviting them to a local county event. And If you think about it even if you have a group of only like a couple thousand people if and on average five percent of people would go and show up at an event 5% of, you know, 1,000, 2,000 people, you know, you've got 50 to 100 to 200 people showing up and flooding a coffee shop. And so from the perspective of those people, they see everyone around is talking and thinking like me, and I don't see this on the news, 
right? So the news must be lying to me because all the people who look like me are talking about the things that I don't hear on the mainstream news. So that must be fake news, right? And what they're telling me is real. And so what, became, what started as an online fantasy came into sort of our, our temporal space and became reality for these people. And then they started self-organizing. And then they started building a leadership structure. And then you know, those groups in that county would then talk to the, another group in those county. And then over time, it, it built into a movement. And that was all catalyzed with data. Um, but the unfortunate thing, it was all based on manipulation and disinformation uh, and treating regular people as if they were an ISIS terrorist. And the thing that I'd say is that I don't see a lot of those people as you know, being necessarily bad people. They may say terrible things, but I see them as victims because they were attacked. They were just attacked in a different way and manipulated. And in the same way that we don't blame victims of fraud for being defrauded, being tricked into believing something, and then you know, having money or something stolen from them. You know, I don't think we should blame a lot of these people for being tricked and essentially having their reality stolen from them. After the reporting from The Guardian and The New York Times uh, on, uh, on the Cambridge Analytica, there have been mixed opinions about, about the real influence of your work. Some say that it didn't have the, the influence you tried to uh, um, perceive, but um, what do you think, what's the right mix of tools for hacking or winning an election, hacking the results of an election, is the tools you used enough or there's a bigger mix? Um, so one of the things that I'd say to that is um, it was what Cambridge Analytica did was one part of a mix of a, a lot of other strategies and things that and, and, and also you know economic environment and political environment. But in an election, you have to remember that you know unlike you know uh, you know a consumer market or B two B market which is elastic and you know not zero sum. Elections are zero sum. There's always one winner and one loser. And if you get only one more vote or one percent more, right? You get fifty one percent and they get forty nine. You win a hundred percent. So the thing that I'd say to that is that even if you know, Cambridge Analytica only had 1% difference or 2% difference or 5% difference. This was the margin in a lot of counties and a lot of states that Donald Trump was winning by, right? And so that, that means that even if it had a, a very narrow uh, impact, I'm not saying that it was that narrow, but even, even if you concede that, it still had a major impact because, you know, you only need one more vote in order to in win an entire election. Um, in, terms of, in terms of what is the sort of right mix, I mean, one of the things that I'd say to that is that, you know, d disinformation um, and, and, and manipulation should, has no role in a functioning democracy, full stop, doesn't. So, you know, it doesn't matter what its efficacy is. If you are undermining people's reality by tricking them and manipulating them, um, you are doing a disservice to society. Uh, and so, you know, I, you know what, what, what's the right mix for an election? Well, let's start with, you know, truth and reality uh, and, and, and move from there. So you mentioned that the people you influenced were, insta in fact, victims. And, I, and I'm sure also here in Romania we have grandparents, parents, friends who were tricked into believing something they saw online. So as a simple user, as an internet user, how can you defend yourself? You, you are ultra connected, you have a Facebook account, you don't actually, but we... No, I'm, I'm banned, so... <laughs> uh, we, we have Facebook accounts, WhatsApp is owned by, by Facebook, Instagram is owned by Facebook, there's this interconnection. How can you defend while being uh, online? Well, this is what's so fucked up about it, is that you can't, because it's like asking, how can we defend ourselves from burning buildings that don't have fire exits, right? It's like, I mean, it's like, oh, make sure you bring, you know, like a gas mask and a fireproof blanket. Like, it's stupid, right? The problem, and this is, this is what is um, so, I, so important, I think, for people to understand, is the language we use and the framing of the questions 
of how we, how we discuss this debate is really important because the implication of how do we protect ourselves from this is that it's your responsibility as a citizen to protect yourself from a fundamentally unsafe architecture, right? And we would not say that uh, you know, about physical buildings. We would not say, we would not, you know, and there is no architect you know, that would be allowed to create unsafe buildings without a fire exit, with bad wiring, and then slap some terms and conditions on the door and say, well, you signed up to, you know, you knew what you were getting into, this, this building might blow up, right? So we, you, you, you couldn't get away with that because they have, they have standards, professional conduct standards that they have to abide by, and we have building inspectors and rules and regulations about what is safe and appropriate for people in the context of an environment and an architecture. And this is what the internet is. It is an architecture. Social media is an architecture. It's not a service, it's an architecture. And so, you know, when I start thinking about it, I, for me, it's sort of the wrong question because it should not be a user's responsibility to even, when you get on a plane, it is not your responsibility to make sure that the engines are checked. You know, when you get a prescription from your doctor, it's not your responsibility to make sure that the molecular isomer of, of the medication is appropriate and safe. When you go and buy food, it is not your responsibility to make sure it's not poisoned, right? That is the role of the state and government to make sure that when you sell something or when you let people walk into something, that it is, it is safe and it's not gonna harm them it's not going to harm society. And what we're seeing with social media is that, you know, this is a completely unregulated space, right? And the, the, the thing that I'd say to that is, like, you eat food, you know, three or four times a day, right? You might see your doctor once or twice a year. You might get on a plane a couple of times, you know, in my case, like, lots <laughs> every week. But, but, you know, these are, but you check your phone on average 150 times a day, right? People literally go to bed with their phones now. And they sleep with phones more than they sleep with people, right? It's true. And so, but yet, the, the people building these devices and building these architectures do not have any obligation to think about the, 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 the harm or the impact that could be done by these devices or these technologies on society or on the user. And so, one of the things that, you know, I think we need in, is, is better regulation, not just of social media companies, but we need professional conduct standards for engineers and data scientists. Just in the same way, if you're an engineer uh, and you're going to build a bridge, you have to have a license for that. And there's, there's standards, you have to meet safety standards, right? There's regulations on the bridge, but there's also regulations on how you build the bridge and how you conduct yourself as a professional. Same with doctors, lawyers, accountants, etc. But the products of software engineers and data scientists now are touching people in a much more intimate way um, on, on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. I mean, how many times, just think about it, in the past hour, how many times have you checked your phone, right? How many times have you, have you used your phone today, right? It, it's all the time. Uh, and so, so if this is something that literally is almost an extension of yourself, we need the people who are building that to be obligated to think about the harm that that might do to somebody. But uh, the internet um, you mentioned as an architecture was built uh, maybe on this utopian uh, thinking of being this free environment. It, it was originally a military project, ARPA, yeah. ARPANET. So let's, let's just be clear, <laughs> that narrative is bullshit. Like, I'm sorry, like, I hear this all the time. Oh, but it's all built on this utopian vision of it. No, it's bullshit. The internet was originally a military project. Just saying that, that's a fact. And uh, and I want to continue. You mentioned the the, the comparison with with the plane. Yeah. Uh, you don't need to check the engine as a passenger, but you need to put the seatbelt on, and uh, just hear what the um, um, stewards are saying. So how do you regulate the the online space while maintaining uh, maintaining it in a freedom? environment, not going to the extreme, uh, what we are seeing maybe in, in, in China with uh, a state-controlled internet, state-controlled apps. Um, how do you stop regulators at one level? It, it, because it, <clears throat> so sets of regulations don't always have to be very specific technical rules. They can be principles, right? I think seatbelts is an interesting example because one of the reasons seatbelts came about um, originally in the United States 
was because insurance companies got tired of paying for mangled bodies because it was really expensive. So actually, insurance companies, and this is the only time I would say thank God for insurance companies, is it, you know, they lobbied Congress uh, really hard because there's a market incentive, right? Um, and the auto, auto manufacturers said, oh, but it should be consumer choice, it should have the freedom, it might inhibit innovation of cars, all of that, of course, was bullshit. Um, and arguably, the auto industry now is better off because it's safer, it increases long-term consumer confidence. What I'd say to the question, uh, though, uh, is the principles that you pick matter. So it does, we don't have to set, create a set of rules uh, you know, or, or you know, state-controlled design like you have in China. We can simply ask like, simple questions like, is the feature that you're creating to be reasonably expected? Is, is the result of it reasonably expected by an average user, right? So for example, when I joined Facebook, uh, this was before I got banned, when I joined Facebook, um, like in 2007, it did not have facial recognition technology. That was very much in its infancy. So I sign up to these terms and conditions that say, okay, we might analyze your data or whatever, right? Now, a couple years later, they then put on facial recognition technology, and all of a sudden, my photos become quote unquote data, because it's visual data. Now, if we had sets of principles, like, is what you're doing reasonably expected, right? That was not reasonably expected. The technology didn't exist when I signed up. It is therefore unreasonable for me to expect that this magic technology will be used, right? If we, if we have principles like, uh, well, now enshrined with the GDPR, privacy by design, which is an engineering principle, but also agency by design, is what you're, you know, when you look at um, how a lot of these architectures are built, it's very, they make it very easy to sign into something or sign up to something and make it very difficult to sign out of something, right? And that, you know, or when you look at even, even things like, um, you know, there's a psychological effect called ludic loops, right, which is the precursor to gambling addiction. So if you think about a slot machine, right, it's a repetitive task that has an occasional reward, right, and people can get addicted to this. Uh, there's a lot of research on it. If you think about swiping your Instagram, right, or just Twitter or whatever, right, it's the same thing. And although we call it quote unquote user experience, that might be creating addictive design. And so I think there's a question about is that res fully respecting the autonomy and agency of the person or are you creating an environment that might become slightly addictive? And if the answer is yes, then maybe you should rethink how you're designing. It's not saying you can't create Instagram, you know, but having a principle like agency by design forces an engineer to ask these questions. So it's not about, you know, it's not like I, I, I'm a data scientist. I love data. I love working with data. I love building tech. I love cool things. I love startups. Um, so I don't want to inhibit you know, the, the you know, sort of free flowing of ideas and, and innovation. But what I do want and I think is needed is when you're considering a new design, having an, a mandatory set of questions that you have to go through and if the answer is, if you answer in a certain way, no, this is not reasonably expected, or maybe I'm not fully respecting the agency of a person, maybe I'm creating something that's addictive, then reconsider your design. And I think regulations at the, the design stage are going to be the most impactful, particularly if they're in the form of professional conduct standards, right? So it's not about necessarily saying that there should be some like grand agency that like you have to you know approve every piece of technology uh, that you make. It's about instilling ethics and values from the beginning from that data scientist when they're making something or when they're even thinking about making something. And so that for me, I think those would be the kinds of rules and regulations that would be appropriate for tech, which would balance the needs of society and also you know the 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 desire to have innovation. So do you believe that, uh, I think that, that technology and the online space uh, is, is scaling at a, at a pace we didn't see uh, any time in, in history? Do you think this is a problem for regulating this stuff because the scale of uh, changes, updates, I don't know, we uh, uh, go to sleep with a, a Facebook version and we wake yeah. up with another with new features. How can you protect yourself and, and the environment, not yourself as a user, but the, the, the um, uh, environment with, um, from, from this scaling rate? 
and, th th and this is why I'm saying that I think if we create sets of rules, they shouldn't, I, 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 I genuinely think that any rule that is technology specific will fail because you know, it, you, 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 you regulate this type of technology or this piece of software and like by the time you've passed that law, it's already out of date. So I don't think that's the appropriate way of doing it. I think s building a culture of ethics within the profession of software engineering and data science is the way to do it. Because if we can, if we can start making ethics part and parcel of your job as an engineer, where you are obligated to, to consider the impact of what you're doing, then we won't necessarily need to go down a conversation about well, how could, what, you know, what to do with all these new versions because the people making those versions are obligated to think about ethics first at the design stage of it. So that's why I, I really think that any, if we're going to create rules, it should be at the design stage and it should be in the form of ethical and professional conduct standards for software engineers. So the software engineers must have uh, uh, standards, but uh, I'm sure you read the last New York Times investigation on, on Facebook practices after the Cambridge Analytica and the PR campaign and the dark PR they, they, they did. What are your thoughts in, in, uh, on, on this uh, article and the Facebook practices, uh, which become much more and more political? And we can think that maybe engineers from Facebook uh, are very well intended, but the company as a whole starts to, to become more and more powerful and is going to, to some places that we saw uh, in the political area. Yeah, so this is, this is, this is why like, we can't leave it to companies to regulate themselves. I'm sorry. Like, the, uh, Facebook has been on you know, a five-year-long apology tour. And so it's always, I'm sorry, we'll do better. I'm sorry, we'll, be, we'll do better. I'm sorry, we'll do better. And every single time they continue to fail and the consequences get more and more severe, right? Facebook is no longer just you know, an application on your phone. It's no longer just a thing that you see ads on. It is literally a, a, a clone of our society in a company's hands where, where the architectures that are being you know, implemented are fundamentally unsafe. They're unsafe for people and their mental health, and they're unsafe for, our, more broadly, our democracy because they're open to you know, hostile foreign interference. Um, and the, 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 when you look at the behavior, you know, let, me, let, me, let me just tell you, when, before even the story came out, right, Facebook kept on sending me threats um, because they did not want the story to come out. And the, when the Guardian, when they found out that the Guardian and the New York Times were going to publish a story, the first thing they, th that they do is threaten to sue them in court over false defamation claims. Right? They said the story is untrue. You know, one week later, they finally admit it, but they were willing to literally lie in court about the 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 veracity of the reporting, and use their weight as a you know billion dollar company to threaten journalists. And when the CTO of Facebook was asked about that at the British parliamentary inquiry, his response was, oh, I just, we just thought that's what you, the, how you handle journalists. What, you threaten them? Like, I mean, so, like, clearly there needs to be some kind of ground rules, you know, and, and the, the thing that I'd say is that I'm not the, you know, should be, I'm, I should not be the one that decides what those rules are. That is a, that is a, a broader discussion for uh, communities and societies around the world to have, uh, and also for, you know, uh, Facebook and other companies like it to engage in that, but currently they don't. What they do instead is they they dig up compromat on politicians and try to you know create fake rumors, you know, and associate them with George Soros, uh, and then leak that out. Like they literally create fake news. As they're defending themselves about doing better on fake news, they're hiring firms that create fake news. Right? Clearly, that that kind of behavior like just shows they cannot be trusted and they cannot handle themselves. They act like children. And so somebody needs to come in, and, and one of the problems, particularly with Facebook, is that its share structure allows people like Mark Zuckerberg to have an authoritarian control over their company. You know, I've met lots of shareholders um, and even board members on you know, Facebook or other, other, other companies like it, and they are genuinely concerned. But the problem is, if you're on the board of Facebook, you can't really do anything, right? If you're a shareholder, you can't really do anything. Because there's only one guy who gets to make the decisions, because he has a voting structure and a share class that allows him to unilaterally make decisions. And for him, it's his baby. He's too personally invested in something that has become too big to be his own. 
Um, and so I think, you know, in that case, you know, there may be a, an appropriate intervention with securities law um, and and regulation of certain kinds of companies that become that have a structure like that, where if you have an autocratic, you know, chairman slash CEO slash majority shareholder, uh, you know, that there has to be some kind of checks and balances, just in the same way that we have with government. You know, these are these are companies that are so big now and so impactful that they have a similar kind of effect on society as government does. So we need to actually start thinking about accountability and checks and balances. Um, I'm sure that um, also here at, at HoutWeb we have startups working at, uh, in, in great technologies and also Facebook uh, uh, at start was, was a great, in, not invention, but a great network. People were happy with it. So um, thinking back in history, we had uh, we are using nuclear energy for good, but uh, it was also uh, used for, for bad things. So how can we protect the tools we are making as engineers, as startups, from being used later for doing this kind of stuff? Um, so it, 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 it's interesting that you say nuclear power because data is very much like you know, an atom of uranium one piece of data alone or one atom of uranium floating in a room is not going to be that harmful. If you put a lot together, all of a sudden you can do a lot of things with it, right? You can power a city with it or you can obliterate a civilization with it. And data and information is like that. Um, and, but when you look at things like nuclear power, there's a lot of rules on what you can and can't do. I mean, there's, there's, there's ground rules. Uh, so, you know, how, how, can, how can we protect you know, uh, it, 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 it literally, I think, having a set of principles that companies and software engineers have to abide by, where fundamentally, are you respecting the agency of people is the first, number one question, is a starting point. Um, you know, there's always going to be problems in the same way that there's, al there's go always going to be problems with nuclear energy or nuclear power or nuclear weaponry. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to have rules to mitigate the problem. Um. Europe has has the GDPR uh, regulation. What do you think about it? Is it enough? I mean, Facebook, uh, because it's it's the main subject, is GDPR compliant? So, is the the regulation enough? Is doing enough? It's it's not the kind of regulation you you want. N no, because the the it, it, it's a broader problem. It's not just about data protection. Data protection is one part of it. Privacy is one part of it. But I think the conversation that we haven't yet had is about respecting people's agency and ability to be in a space where they can exercise choice without undue influence. And the, so the GDPR is great. It's a good start. Um, I, I think in some ways it's a bit heavy handed and in other ways it misses the point, but that's like every piece of legislation. Um, but I think the conversation that we really need to start having is like what, when we are designing architectures and environments where people consume the majority of their information, I mean, if you think about it, how do you keep up with friends? How do you follow the news? It all happens on your phone, right? So these are like really important for people's like perceptions of the world and the choices that they make. And so if we're, if we're creating architectures or if we're creating algorithms that influence that, the, the thing that we need to start discussing is like, how much influence should we allow an algorithm to have on a person's life? Particularly when we think, what happens, you know, people are just starting to put like Alexa in their homes, right? Or Google Home, you know, that, that, that the, we're at the early sort of nascent stages of integrating AI into our physical space. But what happens in five years time, 10 years time, 20 years time, where our environments start thinking about us and for us, right? Not just in the online space, but in the temporal space. And that, that is a question that's really important for us to think about now because it's not, a, it, it's not a privacy issue, it's not a data protection issue, it's like an, it's an issue of what does it mean to be a human when for the first time you know, in the history of our species, we create environments that literally think about us. We, we create something that watches us, that knows about us, that seeks to influence us, that corrects our behavior, that penalizes our behavior based on a set of rules that somebody comes up with. And that feels quite divine in a sense, right? 
It watches you, it thinks about you, it seeks to correct you, right? So are we, are we about to sort of, you know, go on the path of creating an environment which like becomes our own master? And that is, could be quite dangerous for, for like humanity as a species. So I think we need to start thinking about agency and respecting like, what does it mean for a person to make a free choice and, and, and what kinds of principles do we want to protect a person and their ability to be in a, an informational environment that enables them and empowers them to make choices that they genuinely want to make. Uh, we have two more minutes, so uh, I'm just gonna ask you because you you become a whistleblower in the Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal, but we tend to think about whistleblowers as being, uh, I don't know, in the Ecuador embassy in London or maybe somewhere in Moscow, hiding uh, in, in plain sight. Uh, What's life after being a whistleblower in, um, in the Cambridge Analytica scandal? Because you, you said that you, uh, you work with the British and the Canadian government. So, you know, one of the things that I'd say is that I had the benefit of having, um, you know, the story took um, over a year to come out. And the reason for that is because, first of all, I was working with really ethical and responsible journalists at The Guardian and The New York Times who gave me space to make sure that I could then find lawyers that, I mean, there were so many lawyers who went through everything that we were doing to make sure we were compliant and, you know, that we weren't breaking any laws and, um, and, f and, and because of that, that's why I'm, you know, you know, not in trouble, right? Uh, I'm, I'm a witness to an investigation, not a subject or a target of an investigation. Um, and, so the thing that I'd say is that the, the unfortunate thing about, for example, the Snowden case is that he didn't have lawyers, right? He didn't have, you know, he, he, he unfortunately in, the, in a sort of moment made a decision to just hand stuff over without thinking about what to do next. Whereas in my case, The Guardian and The New York Times really helped me from the beginning in a very careful way think about making sure that I'm protected from a lot of very powerful interests who have now really pissed off. Um, but my case is different and unique in the sense that most of the time whistleblowers get completely fucked. Um, and it's not just the Snowdens of the world. Like most whistleblowers are the nurse who reports, you know, abuse in the retirement home because she sees your grandmother being abused or not fed well and then gets punished and fired and no one will hire her because she rats out people, right? And never can work again. And so whistleblowers aren't just people who go and stand up against a big government or big corporation. Whistleblowers often are like the people trying to make sure that your grandmother in the retirement home are safe. Um, and there's very little protections for whistleblowers. Um, so I'm in a very unique and privileged case, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, but a lot of people aren't. Um, my life completely has changed. Um, you know, I like. I live on chronic jet lag now because I keep flying to lots of different countries because there's so many investigations now. Um, but for me, it's really important for people to hear about. And you know, the, the bulk of my time now is actually behind the scenes working on investigations, but also working with lawmakers to figure out what kinds of rules that we should, we should have. So. Thank you. And just to respect the rules from, from Daniel's presentation, let's take one question, one short question, because we are one minute. Uh, so one question over there. Does this work? Hi, Christopher. Vlad here. Uh, one short question, please. Does the whistleblower business pay better than your last job? No, it really doesn't. Um, you know, the, the amount of um, legal costs that one incurs um, going through uh, this process, the, the amount of time, you know, you, you don't get paid to go and testify at Congress, right? So I've testified there now five times. Um, you know, you, so you don't, you know, people don't, you know, lawyers don't work for free. The, the, the amount of, of costs that one incurs as a whistleblower is huge. Um, and it's all to do with legal and travel and testifying and you get uh, torn one way or the other. Um, you know, everybody wants your attention and you get, you know, uh, legal authorities from this country and then this country and this country all demanding that you meet at the same time and you end up having in one week to fly to four different countries. Um, so, no, it doesn't. 
So the initial investment is pretty large. I get it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris, um, for for uh, being here at at How to Web. Thank Cheers. you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.